So we're, um, we're talking about protecting our dominion, and this is probably uh, protecting dominion part three. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're still on number two. So there's five things that we're going to look at eventually that are required in order to protect your dominion. And what I mean by that is your identity. Uh, you know, your identity uh, in this day and time that we live in can be stolen, or at least the threat of that. And if we had more time, I could tell you a super hilarious story about a time where my mom's identity um, was thought to be stolen. And um, I mean, there's just, there's not time. It's too early. It's just a whole other thing. Um, but anyway, it is a thing. And, um, and so what I mean in protecting dominion and that being your identity, Genesis chapter one, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. If you have your Bible, you might circle or underline every time in these three verses, 26 to 28, you see the word dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created he him. Now this wasn't like like um, a statue or like a carving. This was like he breathed his very breath inside of us. Okay, Um, in verse 28, God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So the enemy comes, John 10, 10, to steal, to kill and destroy. He has to deceive you before he can do any of the other two. He can't have anything that you have. He can't take anything that you have until he first gets you to believe a lie. And then after that, Uh, once uh, you're vulnerable in that, you know, it's just a ripple effect and he can begin his work of destruction. So your dominion, your place of dominion has to be protected. So number one, we said you have to protect your vision. And so we said that your vision is actually where God's word meets your talents, which isn't like your talents or what you're good at, but that's like what you've been given to steward revealed to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. So it's word and spirit. You have to have both. This isn't you coming up with your own vision. This is you finding out what he says about you and then evaluating what you have, praying in the Holy Ghost and letting him work with you concerning those things. So number two, last week we started talking about stewardship and um, that's required of you if you're going to protect Um, the dominion that you've been given, your identity. In 1 Samuel chapter two, we looked at the story of Eli, and I just want to bring us up to speed in verse 30. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I indeed that that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me for them that honor me, I will honor and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And so what we see here, God doesn't change his mind, but you have a responsibility in what he's entrusted to you. And if you don't do it, it's kind of like the story that we use a lot when Pastor Charles Neiman was called to the city of El Paso. It was like he saw this vision of him handing, him being handed a torch, which was the message of faith. And, and the spirit of God told him, if you don't do this, I'll get somebody else to do it. And, and Pastor Charles asked him, there were seven other people before him that God had called to do the work that he's doing in El Paso. And so you can't get this idea that like it's for ever settle. Yeah, he never changes his mind, but if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you won't you won't be able to to receive the reward or exp- like you have a part to play. He's not he's not manipulating you in any way, which we have to be aware in even in our leadership that we don't do that. Because people when you violate the character of God, which starts with recognizing what Pastor Dean always says is his sovereignty is best expressed in his unwillingness to force himself on anybody. And so when as leaders, you are persuasive, you're using, you know, manipulation or any of that, that's, that violates the character of God. He doesn't do that. He doesn't move on people that way to get a response. They either choose or they don't. And then you, you walk away. So when it comes to stewardship, we looked at two things. We looked at maintenance, which is, is protecting consistency. You know, I remember years ago and, 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 and again, you know, 
whatever. But so like, well, it was the bread, the bread isn't good, like in the cafe. And I'm like, okay, well, what's wrong with like, why isn't the bread? Well, we, the, you know, somebody's not following the recipe. Well, you're not Paula Deen. Like you don't get to come up in here and like, just like you wing it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't get to not follow the recipe. Like, that's what you're paid to do. Like, you have to f think about when you let one thing slip, and then this slips, and then this slips, and then this slips, what you didn't do exactly what you were told to do, and then before long, this slips. It's just a huge domino effect. It's a huge ripple effect. So part of stewardship is maintenance. What you set out to do, that's why it's so important that with the help of the Holy Spirit, remember we looked at those four different seasons that change? You know, your summer routine as a family is gonna be different than your fall routine. Even as a business, you gotta know that. Like we know, and and, and we, we we do business as an opportunity to, to be a blessing to the community and to, 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 to be based but we know which months are more high producing than others. We know that. So we have to make adjustments. We have to take those things into consideration. Well, as an individual, you have to know that. And in every single season, people get so regimented like this. Do you see any of that in the Lord Jesus? No. He's going from here to there. Like uh, it's, it's this, this flow with the Holy Ghost. But in every season, things change. So you have a fall thing and this is what really works. And we're gonna be consistent at that. And then we're gonna press in the Holy Spirit and we're gonna adjust. But there has to be consistency. If Jesus is the same, Hebrews 13, eight, yesterday, today, and forever, then why aren't we as his children consistent? What message are we really sending? Not, not an accurate one. And then we also said that stewardship is tied to assessment. Now, I believe there are some people that are, that are anointed and, and gifted in the area of like vision and seers. That's a thing. Um, you know, pr prophecy isn't just about foretelling of what's to come because the reality is most of that's already been told. Do you know what I'm saying? If you read the Bible, most of that's in there. But there is a place, like for example, um, you know, that um, Jeannie Wilkerson was an incredible prayer and she was called to um, Brother Hagen's ministry. And so she would see things and, 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 and really help him in that. Because when you're so busy about the business of the ministry, which is what he was doing, he was doing services multiple times a day, then she would see things. Now he saw Rama Bible Training Center himself, but some of the other things, uh, you know, it didn't have a sensitivity to. Uh, tapes at the time, um, tapes, which went on to be CDs, books. You know, Brother Hagen never like, wrote a book, so to speak. Like you, you have to be led by the spirit on all that, right? But there were people that, co that were cooperating with him. So there are some, so, so on a team or in your life, you, you may not be like always graced in that way that you can like, see, we could do this and we could do that. That's okay. Can you be consistent? <laughs> can you just make what's already been put out there consistent day after day after day after day after day, which we can all do that. And, and being a visionary doesn't exempt you from the consistency right. that's required. And sometimes people get frustrated with that. They get frustrated with things that are consistent because they're like, well, why aren't we doing this? And why aren't we doing that? Well, we, we have to do what we're already doing. Right. Right. And we have to do that good. Right. And that requires a lot of people doing their part. We can't just do, yeah, there's lots of great things we'd love to do. You know, you go into your boss's office, well, we should do this. And your boss is like, listen, bro, I had to lay off three people yesterday that aren't right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know. Right. You don't know what's really going on here. You don't know what, what, we're, what we're trying to work out. So both of these things are part of stewardship. So as I, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how this works together because stewardship is word and spirit. So, so really, you're looking at the blueprint of the word of God, like we've been hearing all week long on the simple truth, and you have to determine that this is the standard. That's right. This is the standard, and we're gonna look at it. Because it, listen, how you do other papers, what do I mean? Your company policies, your family creeds, how you do other papers is really tied you know, if you're a single person, you need to have some commitments you make to yourself. Right. Starting with, I'm not going to sleep with people if I'm not married to them. You miss a good one, number one. Um, I'm not going to mess around. I'm not going to be weird. I'm not going to creep around. We don't have time for that. I can't even get into that today. Um, how, you, how you uphold this standard, right, is going to be. So people who struggle with the policies, this is, this is, here's the two words that you need to consider today. Subjective and objective. 
subjective. See, a lot of people, you tell them something and they think that's subjective. Meaning that's up to their own interpretation. Subjective, up to your own interpretation of your mind, subject to how you feel, subject to how you think. Objective is not, is not based on these external stimulants. Let me see if I wrote it for you. No, I didn't give you the definition, but that's okay. You can look them up on your own. <laughs> I gave them to you in part. <laughs> Objective is not, not externally motivated. No, this is facts. This is facts. This is the standard, and I'm not gonna deviate from that until I'm told different. And so with that being said, well, this, is a, this is a combination of how I steward the word for my own personal life and then the sensitivity with which that will unveil for my relationship with the Holy Spirit. So write this down. Pastor Dean said this. I believe this was Tuesday on The Simple Truth, and this kind of sparked this whole journey. Decisions don't come from your head, but from your heart. He said that is why relationship with the Holy Spirit, I'm paraphrasing at this point. Decisions don't come from your head, but your heart. That's from him. I'm paraphrasing this. That's why the relationship with the Holy Spirit is vital in renewing your mind. Like you have to allow the word to get big enough in you that it comes from your heart. This is not just about memorizing scripture. This is not just about getting my mind in line. No, your mind needs to become, become in agreement with your heart, but your heart has to be so full of the word of God. Um, I wrote it this way in my notes, don't write this down, but just in, in thought, you don't decide from your head. Like how many bad decisions have you made that went against all logic? But then all of a sudden, when it comes to the word of God, it's like, if it doesn't surrender to our logic, it's like, you've been doing things against your logic for a really long time. And so now all of a sudden, when it's about the word, you're getting all logical. You don't make decisions from your head. Nobody does. The most logical person in here doesn't make decisions from their head. You make decisions based on your heart. Well, what's about what's going on in your heart? Jeremiah 17, nine says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I like this in the message Bible. It says the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them. This is so good. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. This is how God relates to you, as you really are, not as you pretend to be. Maya Angelou said, when people show you who they are, believe them. That's really important in leaders, for leaders. But it's also important for us because we've all probably said that, well, you know my heart. You know my heart. What we're saying is we're defending a behavior that was wrong and we're saying, but my heart was right. That's a lie. That's a lie. I've had people tell me that. Like, I, you know, but but they love you so much. I don't need their love. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will do what I say. But I love you. You have no idea how much you and Pastor Greg mean to them. They would take a bullet for you. No one's shooting me. No one's shooting me. I don't need you to take a bullet for me. Pastor Greg has plenty of guns. We're good on the gun front. Do do you know what I'm saying? Like you're trying to tell me that there's some good quality in there that overrides whatever bad behavior or inconsistencies are showing up in your life. It's all bunk. It's not biblical. If your heart's in it, there will be fruit. This is where we wanna unpack. If your heart's in it, there will be fruit. So we're starting in stewarding dominion, stewarding our heart. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 10, and then he called the crowd together and said, listen and take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life. Your diet is not the problem with your health. It's important. You'll feel better if you eat right. You'll act better if you eat right. Things will potentially flow better. And when I mean flow, I mean, you gotta go and it's all good. <laughs> but that's not, what, that's not why people are dying. Right. That's not why people are getting cancer right. because it's in sucralose. Please. <laughs> How much sucralose are you gonna have to consume for your body to start eating itself? Come on. Yeah. This is not about your artificial sweeteners. Right. Okay, or whatever else, you know, emissions from this. 
You know, emissions, I'll stick emissions from this where the sun doesn't shine. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is not going to take me out. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, come on. You are in control of your body. You are in control and your body will go the way that your soul goes. And please understand that you may have people around you fooled, but God is not treating you the way that you pretend to be. He's treating you the way that you really are. And if it's in your heart, there will be fruit. There's no, no more. Will you know my heart? When people tell me that, I want to tuck and run, run as fast as I can. Because that's some major self-deception. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life, but what you vomit up. Verse 12, later his disciples came and told him, did you know how upset the Pharisees were when they heard what you said? Jesus shrugged it off. Every tree that was planted by my father in heaven will be pulled up by its root. Forget about them. They are blind men leading the blind. When a blind man leads a blind man, they both end up in a ditch. Peter said, we've always said it this way. When sheep follow sheep, they both jump off a cliff. That's why you have to have a shepherd. You know, you're getting together and you're having these little conversations about what people are doing that are in leadership, whether it's your pastors or your boss. It's a bad deal. Yeah, it's, bad. it's a bad deal. And you know what? Most of the time, you know, these people, they're not even invested. They don't tithe. They don't even tithe. All the people that have problems, they always talk and do better. You don't give offerings. Every single time. People who cause problems are a problem in and of themselves. You're not the problem just talking. You know, they're nobodies. They're not going anywhere. What are you doing? You're not doing anything. You're talking. You don't know what you're doing. Go raise your kids. When a blind man leads a blind man, they both end up in a ditch. Peter said, I don't, I don't get it. Put it in plain English. Jesus replied, you too. Are you being willfully stupid? So that is such a thing. People just don't pay attention. What, tell me what you said again. Remember it when I said it the first time. What does that look? How would that, how would that go? Do you know what I mean? Like, how important was it? I'll see you in two weeks. I apologize. I I forgot to sign your check. And you're, you know what I'm saying? You have these expectations. You have these standards for others that you don't even uphold within yourself. Are you being willfully stupid? Don't you know that anything that is swallowed works its way through the intestines and is finally defecated? Glory. But what comes out of the mouth gets its start in the heart. It's from the heart that we vomit up evil arguments, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lies, and cussing. That's what pollutes eating or not eating certain foods, washing or not washing your hands. That's neither here nor there. Now let's look how Paul unpacked this because there is a standard and it must be upheld. I want you to, if, if you didn't already, I said it, but the standard is not subjective, but objective. If you didn't already, if that didn't already hit your notes, the standard is not subjective, but objective. I also received 1 Corinthians 5. Now, it's important that you know, Paul started the church at Corinth. And um, so it was very important to him. And it was in, you know, one of the most wicked cities at the time. They were very spiritual, but in a lot of other ways, not necessarily. But it worked to their advantage because um, the, the church at Corinth had such beautiful operations of the gifts of the spirit, which is incredible. But at the same time, there were, there were always just things with, with this Corinth church. And we did like a whole series on that in youth. Um, it's whatever, um, where we broke it down chapter by chapter, which is, is awesome. Um, First Corinthians five, verse one. I also received a report of scandalous sex within your church family, a kind that wouldn't be tolerated even outside the church. One of your men is sleeping with his stepmother. And you're so above it all that it doesn't even phase you. Shouldn't this break your heart? Shouldn't it bring to your knees? Shouldn't it bring you to your knees in tears? Now I'm reading from the message Bible um, because I like the wording, but let me go back to um, verse um, one in, and let me give you the word. That word actually is in verse two, and you are puffed up. That word puffed up, you know, it's probably the most aggressive um, in the Greek form of pride that exists in the New Testament. And so it's just, and really, you know, pride gives, gives fuel to carnality. Um, in humility, you know, you, you've surrendered your body, you've surrendered your attitude, you've surrendered your life. Um, so shouldn't, um, shouldn't it bring you to your knees in tears? Um, shouldn't this person and his conduct be confronted and dealt with? 
You know, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, and um, he was telling me about a situation um, in a church, and, um, you know, big church, big ministry, you know, and um, so they're, they're the senior pastors, they had just gotten a divorce and st- all this, and um, so um, one of the parties who was related to this founding pastor, I'm trying to not use specifics, um, was the problem. So the founding pastor, pastor's offspring was the problem. But he got up and he owned it and, and you know, made sure that the other party was cleared in the sense that this was not their fault, they will be restored, you know, didn't sugarcoat it, didn't sweep it under the rug. Um, this, is, this is exactly, you know, we, we don't wanna do that stuff. We don't want to confront stuff. We don't wanna deal with stuff. You can't pray about things God's told you to do something about. Paul said in verse three, I'll tell you what I would do. Even though I'm not there in person, consider me right there with you because I can fully see what's going on. I'm telling you that this is wrong. You must not simply look the other way and hope it goes away on its own. Bring it out in the open and deal with it in the authority of Jesus, our master. Assemble the community. That's like get everybody together. I'll be present in spirit with you and our master Jesus will be present in power. Hold this man's conduct up to public scrutiny. Let him defend it if he can, but if he can't, then out with him. You know, this isn't, this isn't what we do as it pertains to those who are growing disciples, baby Christians that are still learning, but they still have to be confronted. But once you know, and you don't do it, see, there's a standard. And it has to be upheld. It will be totally devastating to him, of course, and embarrassing to you. Paul's acknowledging that. But better devastation and embarrassment than damnation. You want him on his feet and forgiven before the master on the day of judgment. Your flip and callous arrogance in these things bothers me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. Yeast, too, is a small thing, but it works its way through a whole batch of bread dough pretty fast. So get rid of this yeast. Our true identity is flat and plain, not puffed up with the wrong kind of ingredient. The Messiah, our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed for the Passover meal, and we are the unraised bread part of the feast. So let's live out our part in the feast, not as raised bread swollen with the yeast of evil, but as flat bread, simple, genuine, and unpretentious. That's so good. You know, I was thinking about this even on Friday night when Pastor Faith was doing stories with Pastor Pastor Faith, and she was saying, would you rather, would you rather have the, in, you, you're unable to speak until spoken to, or your thoughts always, always accessible to whoever. And the vast majority of people don't want their thoughts exposed to everybody. But why? what's in there because whatever's in there he can see it's naked and open before him and as a man thinks so is he so you basically just said you're a big hypocrite I wrote you in my letter earlier that you shouldn't make yourselves at home among the sexually promiscuous I didn't mean that you should have nothing at all to do with outsiders of that sort or with criminals, whether blue or white collar or with spiritual phonies for that matter. You'd have to leave the world entirely to do that. But what I am saying is that you shouldn't act as if everything is just fine when a friend who claims to be a Christian is promiscuous or crooked, is flip with God, rude to friends, gets drunk or becomes greedy and predatory. You can't just go along with this, treating it as acceptable behavior. I'm not responsible for what outsiders do, but don't we have some responsibility for those within our community of believers? God decides on the outsiders, but we need to decide when our brothers and sisters are out of line and if necessary, clean house. Again, if it's in your heart, there will be fruit. If it's in your heart, there will be fruit. Your fruit just revealed where your heart was. If your heart's inconsistent, your fruit's inconsistent. If your fruit's inconsistent, your heart's inconsistent right? If it's in there, it's going to come out. So again, if your heart's in it, there will be fruit. The standard is not subjective, but objective. In 2 Timothy 3, look at this. 
But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, heady, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such people, turn away. For this is the sort that creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins. I say the gullible woman is just as much to blame. Led away by various lusts. You, you, know, you, you, you know, if you are a born again believer, if you pray in the Holy Ghost, like for real, that's why you gotta really know what's going on in there. Because if you've been in this and there's not progress and there's not fruit and there's not freedom, there's something going on, just deal with it. Just have the humility enough to deal with it and say, I'm not where I think I am. I'm not where I'm acting like I'm a, like I am. You got to deal with it because if you're doing this and you're doing the deal, so to speak, and there's no freedom and there's no fruit, there's a problem. Yeah, so he talks about a couple men who resisted Mo Moses. These men, these men also, okay, okay hold on. No, no, no. I want to go back. I want to go back and we're done for this sort of person. These sort of those who creep into households and make captives of global women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, this is all about the truth. So this is that that, that I was just describing. You're, you're going, but there's no real, it's not coming together. Now, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. They will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. So what you see here is religion will always produce carnality, which is double bad. Then you got two headed monster. But then the key to this is those who have carefully followed. See, Paul's writing to Timothy and he's saying, you've carefully followed. But these others, this isn't okay and it has to be addressed as not okay. See, in 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 15, these things I write unto you, though I hope to come to you shortly, if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Stewardship upholds a standard while creatively relating to the Holy Spirit in every new season. And I think I had kind of said that in a way earlier. Stewardship upholds a standard while creatively relating to the Holy Spirit in every new season. But Paul said, listen, I'm writing you these things so you know how to act here. This is the standard. So you have this for your family. You have this for your church. You have this for your business. You have this for your marriage. Like this is the standard. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, we're out. What a come down this, O Babylon, day star, son of dawn, flat on your face in the underworld mud, you famous for flattening nations. You said to yourself, I'll climb to heaven. I'll set my throne over the stars of God. I'll run the assembly of the angels that meets on sacred Mount Zaphon. I'll climb to the top of the clouds. I'll take over as king of the universe. But you didn't make it, did you? Instead of climbing up, you came down, down with the underground dead down to the abyss of the pit. What I love so much about this picture that we see of Satan's fall, and I wrote it this way in my notes, and this is literally where we're gonna end. God doesn't keep things around to save face. I mean, that's the ultimate, let's just fix this real quick. Do you know what I mean? Nothing's happening on earth. There's no men around. This is just in heaven. You know, right. you save your face, yeah. you save someone else's face, it doesn't work. Right. God doesn't keep things around yeah. to save face. Yeah. Well, I know their heart. Iniquity was found in him. Right. Right. If you got bad fruit, you got bad something going on in here. Yeah. And it's gotta be dealt with. Yeah. And if it doesn't get dealt with, it will deal with you. Right. And that kind of hypocrisy, what, what, did, what did Paul say in 2 Timothy 3? They don't make any progress. They're still showing up, they're still here. But man, you look at them and you're like, gosh, they're in the same place they were five years ago. Yeah, that's true. They're walking around the same mountain and I can't help them. I can't help them.